Superman was never intended to be a comic book character. Comic books were a relatively new concept at the time of his creation back in 1938. Instead, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster initially crafted stories of the Man of Steel with the hope and intention that he would get his own syndicated newspaper comic strip. They drew up a dozen or so strips and pitched the Superman character to publishers for years, only to be met with consistent rejection. But then, there was finally a bite. An upcoming anthology magazine called Action Comics was looking for stories to feature in its first issue that would captivate the imaginations of readers. The publisher was interested in Siegel & Schuster's Superman character to headline the book, but all their newspaper strips would need to be cut up and rearranged to fit the format of comic book pages. And one of those images from inside the Man of Steel's first story would be lifted from the strips and used as the striking, iconic, and instantly recognizable cover of Action Comics number one. It's an image that has spawned countless copycats, homages, and parodies in the last 80 plus years since it was first published. It's even on toy packaging. But as the visual introduction to the most recognizable superhero in the world, this cover didn't do a whole lot to make it clear that Superman was even meant to be the hero. The men running away from this scene look like terrified, unarmed civilians fleeing a bizarrely colorful menace whose presence is announced by a fiery aura of explosive energy. With the context inside the comic, however, readers learn the full story behind this scene. Lois Lane and Clark Kent are on a date when a lowlife named Butch wants to cut in and dance with Lois. She refuses, slaps the thug on the way out, and leaves, abandoning Clark, who maintained his sheepish disguise and didn't interfere in the conflict. Later, Lois is kidnapped by Butch and his lowly crew, but the Man of Steel has now shed his disguise, becoming Superman. He chases after the speeding criminals, lifts the car effortlessly into the air, carelessly shakes everyone out, and then just hammers the vehicle against a boulder for seemingly no reason. If anything, this aggressive act serves only as an opportunity for the villains to get away, which is exactly what happens before the Man of Steel catches up to them. It may not make sense to the plot of this story, but it's a dramatic, triumphant, hell yeah moment that showcases Superman's power. I mean, back in these early stories, the Man of Steel was all about tormenting villains and striking fear into their souls. So destroying a car in an exaggerated show of force just to make a statement isn't out of character for early Superman. But I think we can go deeper. There's a stronger, more symbolic meaning behind this iconic imagery. It has less to do with Superman and more to do with these things. Buckle up, because we're going for a ride down Over Analysis Avenue. Are these card jokes doing anything for you? Are they getting y'all revved up? Okay, I'll stop. So the motivation and themes from early superhero comic books can be described pretty succinctly like this. Technology! Oh my God. As comic scholar Alex Boney wrote in his essay, Superheroes and the Modernist Age, The superhero is, and always has been, a response to the rapid, dizzying forces of early 20th century modernism. The first few decades of the 20th century were marked in America by rapid industrial growth, a shift from rural life to urban life, and worldwide war. At a time when basic human functions, labor, manual production, even running and walking, were becoming redundant and obsolete, superheroes were a refreshing assertion of organic, physical accomplishment. Now this idea isn't anything new. Literary critic Umberto Eco wrote about the myth of Superman back in 1972, giving a similar analysis of superheroes combating the spread of dehumanizing industrialization. But what's interesting is that Superman initially started out not as a hero fighting back against modern machines, but as a personification of dangerous technological advancements. Siegel and Schuster's first take on Superman from a short sci-fi story features a mad scientist who, through innovative technology, creates a Superman that goes on to kill its creator. Certainly not a metaphor for anything I can think of, but, of course, they kept tweaking the Superman character until we got... Faster than a speeding bullet! More powerful than a locomotive! Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound! Look! Up in the sky! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! 
That classic intro from the Superman radio program makes it clear that the Man of Steel is superior to anything our technology can throw at him. And this idea was reflected in the opening pages of nearly every early Superman comic. The Kryptonian strongman would constantly display his superiority to machines, with a special emphasis on showing up vehicles. He'd either outrace them, lift them into the air, or outright punch anything with an engine. Seriously, he loved punching vehicles. Which brings us all the way back to the cover of Action Comics number one, the seminal comic that introduces the world to Superman as he lifts an automobile, an icon of America's industrial innovations, and just smashes it against a rock. I want you to remember that Superman lives in Metropolis, a pretty on-the-nose archetype of a big, technologically advanced city, and yet he still found a rock to hit a car against like a caveman. This is purposeful imagery. It was the late 1930s. Industrial assembly lines had continued to grow more concerned with profits than people, building machinery that phased out humanity, making workers miserable or unnecessary altogether. These were struggles and anxieties that were masterfully expressed through films like Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, which was somehow able to capture the life of an Amazon employee all the way back in 1936. Hey, quit stalling, get back to work. Everything in this factory is being automated to optimize production speed, even at, or perhaps especially at, the cost of the actual workers. Even lunch breaks are considered inefficient, so they bring in an eating machine in an attempt to further optimize the workplace while stripping away more and more of the workers' humanity until they effectively become machines themselves. They would hit the same repetitive tasks for long hours every day in the industrial assembly line that was made popular at that time by the commercialization of one revolutionary product. The automobile! So here's the thing, I'm 26 years old and I've never really learned how to drive a car. I'm a fake adult. All YouTubers are. Regardless, allow me to test my multitasking skills by discussing the history of the automobile while navigating the bustling city streets of- Actually, you know what? That sounds like a terrible idea now that I say it out loud. Can we go to some place a little bit more? Perfect! How could I possibly screw anything up here? Oh, 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 oh my god, time. I've already forgotten how cars work. Dude, dude, dude! What? <laughs> it's fine. So Brian Kremens, author of Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia, describes the automobile specifically as a harbinger of a sometimes ominous inhuman future in American literature published in the first quarter of the 20th century. So think of F. Scott Fitzgerald's horrific imagery that he penned in The Great Gatsby as the character of Myrtle is brutally mangled by Gatsby's gaudy yellow car. Or there's also this pertinent exchange in Booth Tarkington's novel, The Magnificent Ambersons. I said automobiles are a useless nuisance. Never amount to anything but a nuisance, and they had no business to be invented. I'm not sure George is wrong about automobiles. With all their speed forward, they may be a step backward in civilization. But automobiles have come. And almost all outward things are going to be different because of what they bring. It's difficult to overstate just how much cars have changed modern life, though one of my favorite illustrations comes from Swedish artist Carl Gilg, who shows just how little space in a typical modern city is dedicated to pedestrians versus the sprawling chasms of space dedicated to automobiles. So, when Superman takes an object synonymous with callous American manufacturing processes and the anxieties of technological innovations threatening to change society in immeasurable ways, and then hits it against a rock, that means something. To paraphrase Grant Morrison from his book, Super Gods, this act by Superman communicates that he is a hero of the people, a bold humanist response to the depression era fears of runaway scientific advance and soulless industrialism. I mean, heck, Superman's home planet Krypton was a thriving technological civilization that got too ambitious and destroyed itself. Baby Kal-El was sent off to Earth where he crash landed in the heart of rural America to be raised by humble farmers as Clark Kent. But that's what's interesting about Superman. Yes, he's a Midwestern farm boy from Smallville, but he's also that alien from an advanced society and a reporter in the bustling city of Metropolis. He's simultaneously rural and worldly and otherworldly. He's the big blue boy scout 
and the man of tomorrow. There's an inherent duality built into the character, and I think this image on Action Comics number one helps establish these seemingly contradicting ideas inherent to Superman and America as a whole. Like, I'd argue, Superman is pretty American. Yes, there are interpretations of the Man of Steel that have him renouncing his citizenship and effectively becoming a citizen of the world, and there are other versions that change him even more significantly, but the classic tagline I'd wager almost everybody can recite from heart is that Superman fights for truth, justice, and the American way. But much like Superman, at the heart of the American way lies two very different rivaling concepts of what America is and what its role in the world should be, which goes all the way back to the foundation of the country. And yes, this does have to do with him smashing a car into a giant rock, okay? Just follow me. First, we're gonna have to go back to early America. And I mean, really early, like George Washington was still president early. The United States was brand spanking new, and many of the shapers of the country had different ideas about what this young nation would become. And these competing opinions coalesced into roughly two major schools of thought in early American politics. First up were the Federalists, who believed that a united country with its robust manufacturing sector, strategic distance from Europe, and vast land to expand into steel, they thought America could become one of the great powers of the world. This thinking was popular in a lot of modern urban centers and still resonates with those who see America as a nation of big business, a world leader. Many of the ideas the Federalists proposed were found in the creatively titled The Federalist Papers, a collection of essays written by James Madison, John Jay, and you know what I'm gonna do. Alexander Hamilton! However, not everyone was down with Hamilton and the Federalists, and this rival group was burdened with the abundance of creativity and called themselves the Anti-Federalists. The intellectual head of this movement was the founding father and eventual third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who imagined a very different America, one they called an agrarian republic. Instead of trying to be a big shot on the world stage, Jefferson thought that America should be as loose and decentralized as possible, but still one where every white man would be free to own his own plot of land and live self-sufficiently off of it with himself, his wife, his kids, a couple dozen slaves. This idea of America as a place where people could live the simple life of their dreams free and beholden to no one is also very much at the core of the American identity. And this tension between these two American ideals is arguably at the core of the American way that Superman supposedly fights for. We're simultaneously supposed to be a superpower of innovators at the forefront of technology and good old fashioned farm boys. And this brings us back to Superman, who embodies both of these seemingly contradictory ideals in one figure. He's an immigrant and a simple square-jawed man from Kansas. He's a farm boy in the big city. He's a powerful, influential leader, and he also secludes himself in a fortress of solitude. He's the shiny new automobile and the humble hunk of land that battles it head on. Superman is America, contradictions and all. And when readers saw this now iconic image on the newsstands back in 1938, maybe they merely saw an exciting, colorful illustration exploding with action and intrigue, or perhaps they looked a bit closer and found something that resonated with them a little deeper. Something that tapped into their fears or their values about how the world could be or how it should be. And at the heart of it all was this strange character dressed in blue tights and a red cape whose creators had no idea how much they were about to change the world. And it all comes back to this cover, the one that started it all. Action Comics, number one. Jordan, I'll buy you a new car. I won't, actually, don't hold me to that. I don't have, <laughs> it's not in the budget. 
What do you think? Is there more to this image than Superman simply smashing a car against a rock? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you want more deep dives into comics and culture like this, I would love it if you subscribed. If you want to be super great, consider supporting me monthly on Patreon, or you can make a one-time donation through PayPal. I would like to give a huge thanks to Christopher Lang, Lori Timms, Billy Bombs, Everett Parrott, Havelock Smiggles, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, Sonali Manka, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. Click or tap right here to learn about Superman's uncomfortable history with nuclear weapons, or right here to see why Spider-Man and Doctor Strange make the same hand gesture. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. Wee!